I was given three months to live. I couldn't even walk. I knew I was destined for more. Then I decided to restart my career. Welcome everyone to our TechMind Turbine series. My name is Vicky Rawal and I work in tech in the Silicon Valley. Today we are joined with a tech leader who not only runs her own startup called PM Dojo, but she also has had a decade of experience in building products at companies such as HSBC and Atlassian. She also coaches PMs at all levels from Uber, Meta, and LinkedIn to help elevate their careers, secure promotions, or double or triple their salaries. In short, she has a lot of experience in the tech industry and has a lot to talk about her mental health and how she's helped others as well who've had mental health troubles. So why don't we just jump in, Vasky? I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Vidhi, for having me. Really, really excited to get this going. Because of your decade of experience in product management and the fact that you coach a lot of folks in PM and UX and design, etc., what do you think are the biggest stressors? And rather than the stressors, how do you think people can handle those? Like managing a demanding role, stakeholder relationships, trying to prioritize and juggle so many things at once. So what are your tips to all of these people? And how do you actually help them in the day-to-day as well when you notice these? That is a that is a great question, Vidhi. I mean, any role in product, in fact, any role right now in the tech industry is stressful. Mm -hmm. It's always been stressful, but I think there are things happening in the environment that kind of add to that added stress. So, you know, if you want, we can definitely talk about some of those things like that are specifically relevant to the environment that we are living right now. But I think these are some of the things that come up in my coaching sessions, right? And also in like PM Dojo, when I'm working with all of these people who are trying to advance their career in product or design, Many people, you know, I've done that too. We put a lot of pressure on ourselves to have the right answer and to know it all. Um, As a designer, as a PM, it's a generalist role, right? We have to know what product management is, what design is, how to do design, how to do research, how to do, like, I'm not talking about that. But in general, when it comes to the business, the domain, the kind of problems, it's very fluid. Things are changing in a very, very fast pace. And so often you're going to be working on problems that you potentially don't know much or you think you know, and maybe you do know, but you are probably going to know the least compared to a whole bunch of other people who have domain level expertise. And so I think a lot of the stress just comes from this artificial pressure that we put on ourselves, especially for PMs, that we need to have the answers because everyone's going to look at us for answers. And it's very important to reframe that and understand that our job, especially from a product management standpoint, is not to have all the answers, but we need to know who to bring into the room so that we can get to the answers, right? So I think having the answers to getting to the answer is a big reframe that needs to happen. And of course, that comes with confidence that comes from having relationships and really knowing how to build relationships. It also changes the whole narrative around stakeholder management to actually influencing people. And it's a subtle change that happens because once you start having good relationships, even if you don't like people, you know, for most part, you will come to a place where there is that mutual respect, even with those senior leaders, right? And as as PMs and, you know, especially for PMs, you do, we do have this special privilege in companies to forge that back, you know, two-way relationship, it takes a lot of work and it starts with you. And I think that is another thing that is really important to understand. It's got nothing to do, it has a huge impact on mental health eventually, Mm -hmm. right? Long-term, it may not be a mental health strategy, but over long-term, even short-term, medium-term, if you have those healthy relationships, that two-way relationship with senior leaders, you can really, really avoid a lot of those drama and toxicity that happens, right? So that is one thing. The other thing is that a lot of the times, I think we expect 
and this is this is a controversial topic. We expect that the senior leaders should be knowing everything, right? And I found myself too, I'm like, well, why, why don't they know this? Like, you know, if I can know this, like, why don't they know this? What are they doing sitting up there? You know, just making these lofty comments. It took me years to understand once I sat there that the kind of problems I am solving and I'm having to think about and the mess that I'm dealing with on top takes a lot of mental energy. And no, I might not be an expert as all of my P, all the PMs and the designers in my team, they know that problem space perhaps a lot more than I do. And I trust them with that. My job is to actually support their growth, not have all the answers to everything. Like if I knew how to solve that problem in and out, then I would have done that myself. I didn't need a team. You know, and, and this is why I'm saying it's a very controversial um, take out here, but just like how PMs and designers, we are, we are taught to be empathetic for our users, really understand the pain points, and then kind of come up with a solution. This is also, again, another reframe that we need to make when we are working with our senior leadership right, with our stakeholders, what are their pain points? You know, what are they trying to think? And a lot of times the senior leaders, depending on what's going on, it's very contextual, they'll be worried about revenue, you know, market position, a lot of those other things. And we have to come and speak that language and it is our job to forge forge that relationship, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that as a senior leader, you have to be clueless. There is no place to be clueless. And, you know, I've certainly seen that as well. So I'm not kind of saying that, yeah, being clueless, great, you know, they're still a great leader. But I don't think it is fair to expect senior leadership to be knowing ins and outs about each of your product lines. And I hear that a lot when I'm coaching PMs, coaching designers. They're, you know, they've come to a place where, as you rise up, you have to become more of a generalist. Your worries are totally different while you're still there to support and grow your team. And it also helps with the mental health of the PMs and designers because then that relationship helps out. You know, I think setting boundaries when you can um, is also extremely important. And I, I think a lot of times people take setting boundaries as a blanket statement. You know, so what happens when you are a lead designer or a PM and there is a release that's happening and there are a whole bunch of problems that crop up just one day before the release. And yes, I have a blanket thing. I'm not going to work after 6 p.m., but stuff needs to be done because the stake is very high. Do you still follow that blanket rule or do you make an exception? So again, being very acutely aware that yes, you have to set boundaries, absolutely. But when when do rules need to be broken? Because we all break rules in real life. So in work also sometimes, right? I think the other thing that I wanted to share here is two things. One, I think knowing when to leave and what battles not to fight. People in product design, we are in a role where most people in the organization will have opinions, either about how we have to do our job or about the quality of our work, because it is subjective to some extent, right? It's not like engineering, right? It's not like finance. It's not like marketing. Um, and, and so given that that is what the context of this field is, I, I think we also have to start learning what fights are worth fighting. You know, do sometimes, sometimes you can say a lot without saying anything, you know, and you can express your frustration. You can express a disagreement without um, saying much. And so words and um, those things are really important. You have to be very mindful about that, you know, your tone, your body language, like, and that is something I've struggled with because I've never been able to hide my emotions. If I feel frustrated or angry, it shows up on my face and it doesn't do well. So I think knowing, you know, what fights are worth fighting, how you need to handle a lot of those, um, when to leave a situation, when to leave a job, you know, for how long do you need to leave? You know, don't wait until the end. Like if you feel like you've given enough, you've done everything, but it's just not working out, start planning your exit plan. Like don't wait until you go right at the lowest of the lows where your motivation, your confidence, like everything is just depleted. And then you're going to really struggle to find another opportunity and show that passion and excitement, right? Like you don't want to, again, approach your career with an empty cup, right? Like you, you can't be drained. It has to be at least half for you to have that positivity. And I think the last thing is like anytime there is a, 
you know, a challenging situation, especially with people at work, which is bound to happen as PMs and designers. Um, I think it's, I've done that too. It's very easy to blame the other person. Oh, mm -hmm. the other person is doing, not doing X or it's doing Y and that is not correct. This was something one of my mentors told me years ago and it's taken me, it's taken me a long time, I think, to get to a place now where I am somewhat comfortable, somewhat, I'm not fully, somewhat comfortable asking myself again, you know, it takes two to tangle, right? It's not a one. Otherwise, you both are doing a totally different dance, right? That's what I tell myself. But if the two people are involved and things are not going well, I think it's a very, very good exercise and a healthy exercise to ask yourself, what am I doing? to cause this situation and then looking at ways to actually change. Um, I think what you're doing where possible. Um, I, I think a lo lot of times I've done that to where I've just blamed it on the other person um, and that's not taking ownership. That's not high agency, which PMs are supposed to have. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like these are some of the things, even though they are not mental health strategies, but they are strategies to actually improve the quality of our work and how we think about our career. If you can, how about you tell us a bit about your journey in the tech industry and what rituals do you follow today to help balance your mental health? So I started in the tech industry almost almost two decades ago. My first role was actually tech support, <laughs> which I knew I was destined for more. And I wasn't ready to just settle for a tech support role. But when you're an immigrant, you are a student on international visa, you have bills piling up, you have a huge loan that you need to repay that your parents took in order to send you to the US, you do what you do. And the salary was definitely better than $7.25 that I was making as a student in an on-campus job back in the day. So I accepted it. But, you know, there was hope that the company that I joined, it was a five-person startup. And it seemed like my gut said that there's going to be lots of room for growth because it was five people it was really small. It was at the cusp of disrupting a real estate tech industry back in the day when real estate tech did not exist. And so that was my gut. And that's how I experimented into my tech journey. And that was that first out of university job that I took. I pitched myself in three months to take on a role. I had written about it on LinkedIn just recently this week. That's how I got into product management without really understanding what this field is about. Because back in the day, 18 years ago, product management did not exist, right? Formally as a, as a discipline, there were no books, no podcasts, no one talked about it. I don't even think I was on LinkedIn back, back in the day. So where would you find other PMs to talk about yeah, that's how I got started. And something that I, right time, right place, maybe a little bit of how I was approaching my career, perhaps a little bit of who I was surrounded by, which I'm really, really privileged and thankful for looking back in my career. I went on to take on other disciplines within the product realm. So I started doing research, got involved in that. I did design. Back in the day, research and design weren't known as UXR and UXD like they're known today, but I mucked myself, you know, did all of those things. I joined the innovation lab in HSBC, got to work out of the UK headquarters. Really, it was an amazing set of experiences, just kind of increasing the breadth and the depth in that field without really understanding what the hell I was doing. Because again, these functions were not formalized. And yeah, and then we traveled quite a bit. We led a little bit of a nomadic lifestyle, you know, no kids, not that many responsibilities. Working internationally was something that was really important for me. And so I was considering going to Greece and working with HSBC. I think there was a financial collapse or something that happened back in the day. And so I went over to Bermuda within their tech and business team, leading innovation and the future of what internet banking might look like. And then we moved to the Bay Area. I joined Atlassian. That was an amazing experience. And yeah, over the course of, I think, 18, 20 years, I've been a hiring manager, I've worked in quite a few different tech companies. I've also moved across different domains in the tech. So SaaS to finance, to climate tech, back into SaaS, 
MarTech, like a whole bunch of different domains. I took on growth and I started a growth function in a company. I got involved in merger acquisitions. Again, not that my background was in merger acquisitions, but that has been like a common theme in my career. And then I was promoted as the president at the last tech company that I worked. And then in 2019, I decided to throw all of that you know, huge salary and title and all of those things. And I decided to restart my career as a little bit of what most people call an older entrepreneur, because I don't quite fit the typical definition of an entrepreneur. I started in my 40s in my entrepreneurial journey and rest is history. So that's what I've been doing. Awesome. That's super cool. Now, now, how about you walk us through your mental health and how you actually handle it today? You're in being an entrepreneur and how probably give us a quick gist of how it has been before in yep. historically. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I remember you asked me the question also about the mental health rituals. Um, so I'll I'll try to answer all of that in this particular question. So 2019, I, you know, and I've written about this a lot on LinkedIn, which a lot of people come to me and say, well, why would you write it in a professional platform, all of your struggles? And we can talk about that with you if you want. But I was very intentional. It took me a long time to write. But in 2019, my health had collapsed. I did not know it was mental health crisis that I was going through. My physical health at the end was really, really in a bad shape. I was given three months to live. I found myself, I couldn't even walk like a, a block. I would start crying. I just wanted to disappear. I thought it was stress, extreme stress. Um, I assumed it was because of a lot of trauma that we as a family had gone through since the birth of my son and his open heart surgeries and things like that. I had never taken time to pause and take care of myself, you know, as a new mother, because we were just in the hospital in and out, going through one open heart surgery after the other. And it wasn't a time I don't even think the thought of taking care of myself or resting uh, came in my mind, right? Like everything that we were doing was to keep my newborn alive. And then once things got a little better and we returned back from the U.S. to Vancouver, you know, and he was doing well, I just got back into the realm of working and using that to switch off from all of those other emotions that kept on coming. But I didn't think much of it, Right. And I think just socially conditioned, mental health wasn't a topic that was talked before the pandemic as it is talked now for whatever reasons, right? Um, and I think, again, culturally, mental health was not a topic that I grew up talking about. I mean, anytime if topic around mental health was brought up, there was no understanding of even the difference between the different folks who can help you. It was always like, my naive understanding was psychiatrist and that meant something was wrong with your head right and I don't want to be disrespectful here about this topic but it was a huge taboo topic growing up back in India even after coming to North America we didn't talk about mental health right if you know we just hid it under the realm of oh there's a lot of stress just take you know the Friday off or just go on a vacation every two weeks and things are going to just get better so Again, being an immigrant, restarting your life, there are all these things that work that the narrative that you build inside of you is you have to work hard. There is no way because if things don't work out, you'll have to go back or you need to be financially that much strong so that you're not running into a lot of these challenges because you come here with nothing, right? Like you don't have generational wealth. You have to start everything, right? And so I think a lot of those pressures kept on building up to the point where in 2019, I was feeling very sick, but I also did not want to go to the doctor to even talk about it. A little bit was just distrust in the whole medical field after seeing what had happened to my son when his first surgery because of carelessness didn't go well when we were almost close to losing him. So I never even had like a full checkup that women do, that moms do after giving birth. I didn't even have that. And it was five years already, four years, I think, three and a half, four years. So that's huge, right? But 
I think, yeah. And so 2019, when I finally went to my doctor, all of my numbers, like whether it was iron level, whether it was my blood pressure, like everything was dangerously high and I was given three months to live. And it was then that we started looking into all these other things that were going on in my life. And she suggested that I go and meet with a therapist just to kind of figure it out, just because there was a lot of stuff that I was carrying through and I was just crying the whole time, like whole time I was just crying at work. I was crying. I would, I remember I gave like all hands keynote in my company and I was in tears before I somehow, you know, kept myself strong during those 10 minutes. And as soon as the 10 minutes got over, I just ran into the restroom in the office and I just like, I just couldn't like, but I didn't take even a minute to ask myself, like, what was going on? Like all of these feelings that I'm feeling, like I've never felt before, like is something that I need help, nothing. So anyway, as I started working with the therapist, we realized there was PTSD. There was a whole bunch of anxiety. Like I was reliving, you know, sounds from the cardiac ICU. I was seeing my son, not as a three-year-old, four-year-old. I was still seeing him as a newborn with all of those hookups. I was still seeing his chest open. I could still see his heart. Like those were the images that I was still living almost mm-hmm. four or five years later. So yeah, my, my, my overall health emotionally, mentally, and physically was just in the downhill. And yeah, so I had to do what I had to do. I took a few weeks off thinking I'm going to just medical leave, figure it out, just get better. I just didn't feel, I think once I took that two weeks off and I un, like logged myself out of Slack and email, work email and work Slack, I really started, I think, questioning, especially with my therapist. And ultimately, we made the decision. I made the decision. I'm going to step down. And that was a battle in its own, stepping down from, you know, the so-called breaking the glass ceiling and all of those things. But I did. And uh, yeah. And after that, I had to really kind of get better. So that was my mental health struggle, right? So PTSD, which you cannot diagnose just like that. But it took months of therapy um, and again, figure out what kind of therapy modality is going to work for me to kind of realize what was going on. And then since then, it's been it's been small things that I do. I tried following a lot of the advice from my therapist and my from my doctors and from other people. When things get complicated in my life, I either just give it up or basically I just cringe at doing it like many people. But I I think I've also come to a point just realizing now that with so many things going on, even though my son is doing well, I think there is a big part of my brain and heart that still worries about his safety. And I am still reliving a lot of that trauma that I need things simple from a, from a ritual standpoint. So there are small things that I do, right? Whether that is, and I'm privileged, I can say now that I run my own company. I don't have to answer to, you know, my boss or my stakeholders that I'm able to do a lot of those. I don't think I would have been able to do it perhaps if I was still working at a company. Depends on what type of company, but most of the companies, it would be challenging. Simple things I do, you know, things such as, recognizing some of my triggers like before I was totally oblivious now if I start sensing you know what I've been getting this strange headache or maybe I'm getting hives hives are like my perfect perfect sign that my body and my mind and my emotions are telling me something's not right especially if it's not food allergy right so you know, if I start seeing that, it gives me a signal that, you know what, something's not right. I need to do like a self-check. And so that's something that I do. Very simple. It's just about, I think, being aware as opposed to just letting go of whatever you're feeling. So I've become much more aware of, I think, those signs and those triggers. Taking it slow, you know, I am very particular about, I think, not burning out right now. That doesn't mean I don't work hard. I still work extremely hard, you know, as a solopreneur, running a business, doing everything on your own from teaching and coaching to marketing, finance, operations, like building the community, pro bono work outside of PM Dojo, being a mother at home. It's a lot, but it also means that I am very conscious and intentional about what I say no to right so there are a lot of things that I'm you know I'm gonna be like hey sorry I can't do it right now or 
you know, I can do it right now or I just won't do it right now. Like, no, um, I just don't have the capacity. Um, I'm very intentional about the kind of people I work with. I think that is, again, something I'm privileged that I can do that right now. So I have refused like lots of money from a client engagement standpoint if I feel like it's going to be toxic or maybe there is not a mutual fit. And again, for people who work, it may not be as easy, but for me, I know I can do it. And so I am going to do that. I do things that bring me joy. So anytime if there is something, you know, an initiative that I keep on launching these little, little, little projects, if I feel that, you know what, it's not working out, I'm not going to force myself to continue doing that. Um, so I think from a work standpoint, that intentionality has just increased you know, at the end of the day, I always ask myself, you know, is it filling my cup? And do I end my day with a filled cup? Or am I ending a day with a drained cup? And if it's drained, then it again brings back that reflection exercise, like where is it sucking my energy, I need to remove it. So yeah, uh, no room for toxicity. <laughs> that is something that's been heavenly, um, both situations, circumstances and people. But again, with that, I think I've become very, very reflective because a lot of times I might be causing to that toxic, toxic situation as well. Right. So I think I think that just reflection has become much more natural in me. Simple other things, you know, walking with my dog and just sitting by, you know, the water feature in the park. You know, he doesn't expect anything from me. He's super happy when I'm going for a walk with him. You know, he's just going to be hugging and kissing. I think that just that's been like one of the best things we've done in since 2019, like getting Wolfie. Um, he's just been amazing. I think finding little times to talk with my son, I think that's been very therapeutic. Um, so I still massage my son, after, you know, before his nap and his nighttime sleep. And I find peace in it, you know, just seeing him grow and listening to him and all the conversations. I think that's therapeutic for me. It doesn't sound like a mental health ritual, but it has become a ritual for me in all these years. Uh, reading books, even if it's one section, one page, one chapter. Yeah. Um, and basically not caring about the opinions of others. I think that's been a savior as well. Like I don't care. Literally, I give zero thought to what others think about me. I like it's subjective, right? Like there are some people that I really care about and I'm going to really care about what they have to say and the feedback. But then you also live in a world where it's become so easy to put out a nasty comment because, you know, behind the walls of social media. And so, yeah, I, when I receive those nasty comments on an everyday basis, I will ignore, you know, I'm going to be like, you know what, you're probably not having a great day. Let's move yeah. on. That's it. So very simple stuff. Yeah, no, thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing your personal story and what you've been through and then also giving very proactive tips which i feel like several of us in the tech industry can follow so i think with that i'll move it to the next question which is do you have like any last two lines that you want to share for people who are like feeling very stressed or burnt out because of the pandemic and how things have been or maybe even today at work they're worried about layoffs because it has been going around it's stopping now but for all of these folks like how yeah. they hmm. be what they should be doing to maybe find a new job or like relax and get the bigger yeah. picture? Absolutely. Um, this is a great question again, Vidhi. Um, I think few things. One, I would say, and, and this, this, this advice uh, came to me from my mentor, probably in my third or fourth year of working. And I had ignored this advice for the longest period of time because I could not understand what the hell he meant. Uh, but once I understood, it actually really changed how I started approaching my career. And this one advice um, that he had was to treat your career like a business. Mm -hmm. So just like a business, you know, business invests in its resources, it's planning for unforeseen situations with business continuity plan, and you're investing in the business so that you can get return. If you start thinking about your career like a business, you are going to get intentional about how you're going to be investing in your career, which means either upgrading your skills, either really, again, having the foresight to understand, well, how is my field going to change? 
how is the role going to change? Now, I can give you a very classic example, like with AI and everything. No, it's not going to take away our job, but just like over the last 10 years, the field of design and PM, product management, has been evolving and changing. AI is going to, it's already bringing about that change. So if you're going to be only doing tactical work in, you know, you're not going to have that full stack skills. Yes, your role might be in danger. We already know those signs. How can you see those signs one to two, three years beforehand so that you can start preparing your business mm-hmm. continuity plan, your con- your career continuity plan beforehand. And so I think, you know, this is where you can't just let your career happen to you. You have to be very proactive and active, um, proactive about if that is something that you care for, right? If that is something that is important. And I know that sometimes in our lives, career might be just a venue for getting a paycheck and that's totally fine. I've been through those periods as well. So I'm not suggesting here that everyone suddenly should start kind of getting all gung-ho about their career. I'm not saying yeah. that. There are phases in our life, stages in our life, where family gets more important or me as a person gets more important and career. But whatever that phase is, you have to kind of treat that as a business so that you're making better decisions as opposed to just kind of going in a lull and just letting things happen. Oh, everybody's doing courses. Let me just sign up for another course, right? So I think that would be one advice. Um, And I think what my mentor told me was that there is no job that is recession proof. There is no, there are no guarantees in your career, but you should always upgrade your skills so that you make it easier for companies to hire and promote you and that much harder to replace you. Mm -hmm. and this goes back to my previous point right like if you're having that foresight you will find that even though you may not be irreplaceable the company is going to be able to find opportunities or better you will find opportunities within the company to put yourself and take up that project take up that messy problem that no one wants to touch and you could actually grow And people will see that and then people will start kind of promoting you as well internally as well, right? So I think that is really, really key. I think the second thing is all our experiences, everything that we go through, all of our learnings as we're learning, we also unlearn, we have to unlearn. All of this compounds over time. There are no shortcuts. Unfortunately, I wish there was a shortcut. Like I wish I could grow PM Dojo into a billion dollar company, right? By following all this advice that I hear on Instagram and TikTok and LinkedIn, like, oh, just work, you know, go and stay, you know, six months in Mexico and another four months in, you know, Costa Rica and just have this thinking time, you know, take a sabbatical and, you know, I'm writing a book, you know, why someone asked me the other day, why don't you just take like three months off, you know, go off, you know, and just in peace, write a book. And I'm like, I've got an eight year old. I can't do that. And, and they said, well, he should be independent. You know, your partner is there. I said, yeah, I totally trust my partner. Uh, but I know that as a, as a mom and what we've gone through as a family, I won't be able to do that. Like, I would love to. It sounds great that I can do whatever I want and work on my stuff without having to worry about snacks and cutting apples and grapes and all of those things. Um, But I won't, my heart won't be there. So I I think it's very important to separate blanket advice and really being aware of what is going to work for you and then figuring that piece out. Um, I think that I would say, and figure out like everything that you do, do it with a long-term view and long-term thinking, because you know that your learnings and unlearnings are gonna compound over time, right? For folks who are going through layoffs, I would say, you know, my heart goes out uh, for, for folks who have been impacted, the folks who have not been impacted and perhaps are feeling guilty, um, and angry and frustrated and scared and all those emotional roller coaster. I've been there on both sides of the table. On the receiving end, um, I once got laid off on a Saturday um, with a text message because it almost felt like someone was breaking up with me. Um, but <laughs> so, you know, uh, but I've also been on the other side of the table delivering those hard messages. Um, I can tell you that when you look back in time, these things are most likely going to be tiny little blips in your career. And I think that is the mentality that I would like to encourage. I know it's extremely difficult at the moment to be seeing it that way, 
But if you, again, keep your eyes, you know, long-term, big picture, what you are really, you know, what you came to this earth for, uh, and this is where I'm getting a little philosophical, uh, what you're really meant to be, what you are meant to do, what you're meant to achieve, these things are, again, tiny little blips. And for anyone in the job market, if you have been impacted, you know, a lot of times I think we over explain, you know, oh, I was laid off. How do I explain this layoff? You don't have to. The, the company that you're applying for, they don't need to know why that end happened in the first instance. If the topic does come up, you can always say, you know, and, and how, again, you frame your answer without over explaining and over justifying yourself is really, really key. I think a lot of times I hear, you know, people are like, well, how do I explain this? I left. It's going to show a gap in my market. And if anything we've seen since the pandemic is that everyone has a gap in the market. Everyone. So why are we like hyper focusing on that gap? You, we need to talk about everything that we have and everything that we've achieved as opposed to hyper focusing on what we don't have at the moment. And I think that's what I'd like to share with everyone. You know, take care of yourself. Uh, think long term. Um, be very strategic about, you know, your career like a business. Treat it like a business where you're making those investments um and and make sure that you have those career um continuity plans and your life continuity plans um your life and your career are very very intertwined and so we cannot be thinking about one without the other um and think about you know your different phases like you know what are you doing now what might you know what what kind of work you would like to do over the next 5 years 10 years don't go after titles but the kind of work because again titles are so fluid in the tech industry what i've seen over so many years things change titles change work is going to change go after the kind of problems you want to solve and the and the and and your titles and money and success and all of those things will come go out, go after the kind of work yeah i think that was ending it at a very fine note so yeah, thank you, Bosky, for the amazing conversation and revealing your true authentic story and giving us a lot of inspiration and help with our mental health. Thanks again. Thank you.